Welcome to this YouTube channel. In this video we are going to talk about 10 facts about Farah Deba Pahlavi. Before starting the video, please like this video, and subscribe to this YouTube channel for our future updates. Farah was born into a prosperous family, whose fortunes were diminished after her father's early death. While studying architecture in Paris, she was introduced to the Shah at the Iranian embassy, and they were married in December 1959. The Shah's first two marriages had not produced a son, necessary for the succession, so there was great rejoicing at the birth of Crown Prince Reza the following October. Farah was then free to pursue interests other than domestic duties, though she was not allowed a political role. Number 10. The young Farah Deba began her education at Tehran's Italian school, then moved to the French Jeanne d'Arc school until the age of 16 and later to the Lycée Razi. She was an accomplished athlete in her youth and became captain of her school's basketball team. Upon finishing her studies at the Lycée Razi, she pursued an interest in architecture, a col spéciale d'architecture in Paris, where she was a student of Albert Besson. Number 9. Many Iranian students who were studying abroad, at this time were dependent on state sponsorship. Therefore, when the Shah, as head of state, made official visits to foreign countries, he frequently met with a selection of local Iranian students. It was during such a meeting in 1959 at the Iranian embassy in Paris, that Farah Deba was first presented to Mohammad Reza Pahlavi. After returning to Tehran in the summer of 1959, the Shah and Farah Deba began a carefully choreographed courtship, orchestrated in part by the Shah's daughter Princess Shahnaz. The couple announced their engagement on 23 November 1959. Number 8. Farah Deba married Shah Mohammad Reza on 20 December 1959, aged 21. The young queen of Iran, as she was styled at the time, was the object of much curiosity and her wedding received worldwide press attention. Her gown was designed by Yves Saint Laurent, then a designer at the House of Dior, and she wore the newly commissioned Nurol and Diamond Tiara. After the pomp and celebrations associated with the imperial wedding, the success of this union became contingent upon the queen's ability to produce a male heir. Number 7. The Shah's previous marriages had given him only a daughter who, under agnatic primogeniture, could not inherit the throne. The pressure for the young queen was acute. The Shah himself was deeply anxious to have a male heir, as were the members of his government. Furthermore, it was known that the dissolution of the Shah's previous marriage to Queen Soraya had been due to her infertility. The couple had four children, Crown Prince Reza Pahlavi of Iran, born 31 October 1960, Princess Farhanaz Pahlavi of Iran, born 12 March 1963, Prince Ali Reza Pahlavi of Iran, 28 April 1966 4 January 2011, Princess Leila Pahlavi of Iran, the 27th of March 1970 to the 10th of June 2001. Number 6. The exact role the new queen would play, in public or government affairs, was uncertain with her main role being simply to give the Shah a male heir. Within the imperial household, her public function was secondary to the far more pressing matter of assuring the succession. However, after the birth of the crown prince, the queen was free to devote more of her time to other activities and official pursuits. Mohammad Reza was always very attracted to tall women and Farah was taller than her husband, which led him to wear elevator shoes to disguise this fact. Usually when the imperial couple were photographed, one or both would be sitting in a chair or alternatively, the Shah and his wife were photographed on a staircase with Mohammad Reza standing on the upper stairs. Number 5. Like many other royal consorts, the queen initially limited herself to a ceremonial role. The queen initially limited herself to a ceremonial role. In 1961 during a visit to France, the Francophile Farah befriended the French culture minister André Malraux, leading her to arrange the exchange of cultural artifacts between French and Iranian art galleries and museums, a lively trade that continued until the Islamic Revolution of 1979. Farah and Mohammad Reza usually spoke French rather than Farsi to their children, she spent much of her time attending the openings of various education and healthcare institutions without venturing too deeply into controversial issues. However, as time progressed, this poetion changed, the Queen became much more actively involved, in governmental affairs where it concerned issues and causes that interested her. She used her proximity and influence with her husband, the Shah, to secure funding, and focus attention on causes, particularly in the areas of women's rights and cultural development. Farah's concerns were the realms of education, health, culture, and social matters, with politics being excluded from her purview. However, Mohammad Reza's politically powerful twin sister Princess Ashraf came to see Farah as a rival. 
It was the rivalry with Princess Ashraf that led Farah to press her husband into reducing her influence at the court. Number 4. One of the Empress Farah's main initiatives was founding Pahlavi University, which was meant to improve the education of Iranian women, and was the first American-style university in Iran. Before then, Iranian universities had always been modeled on the French style. The Empress wrote in 1978 that her duties were, I could not write in detail, of all the organizations over which I preside and in which I take a very active part, in the realms of education, health, culture and social matters. I would need a further book. A simple list would perhaps give some idea, the Organization for Family Well-Being Nurseries for the Children of Working Mothers, teaching women and girls to read, professional training, family planning, the Organization for Blood Transfusion, the Organization for the Fight Against Cancer, the Organization for Help to the Needy, the Health Organization, the Children's Center, the Center for the Intellectual Development of Children, the Imperial Institute of Philosophy, the Foundation for Iranian Culture, the Festival of Shiraz, the Tehran Cinema Festival, the Iranian Folklore Organization, the Asiatic Institute, the Civilizations Discussion Center, the Pahlavi University, the Academy of Sciences. Number 3. Farah worked long hours at her charitable activities, from about 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. every weekday. Eventually, the Queen came to preside over a staff of 40 who handled various requests for assistance on a range of issues. She became one of the most highly visible figures in the imperial government and the patron of 24 educational, health and cultural organizations. Her humanitarian role earned her immense popularity for a time, particularly in the early 1970s. During this period, she traveled a great deal within Iran, visiting some of the more remote parts of the country and meeting with the local citizens. Her significance was exemplified by her part in the 1967 coronation ceremonies, where she was crowned as the first Shabanu, Empress, of modern Iran. It was again confirmed when the Shah named her as the official regent should he die, or be incapacitated before the crown prince's 21st birthday. The naming of a woman as regent was highly unusual for a Middle Eastern or Muslim monarchy. Number 2. The great wealth generated by Iran's oil, encouraged a sense of Iranian nationalism at the imperial court. The Empress Farah recalled of her days as a university student in 1950s France, about being asked where she was from, when I told him Iran. The Europeans would recoil in horror, as if Iranians were barbarians and loathsome. But after Iran became wealthy under the Shah in the 1970s, Iranians were courted everywhere. Yes, Your Majesty. Of course, Your Majesty. If you please, Your Majesty. Fawning all over us. Greedy sycophants. Then they loved Iranians. Number 1. From the beginning of her reign, the Empress took an active interest in promoting culture and the arts in Iran. Through her patronage, numerous organizations were created and fostered to further her ambition, of bringing historical and contemporary Iranian art to prominence both inside Iran and in the Western world. In addition to her own efforts, the Empress sought to achieve this goal with the assistance of various foundations and advisors. Her ministry encouraged many forms of artistic expression, including traditional Iranian arts, such as weaving, singing, and poetry recital, as well as Western theater. Her most recognized endeavor supporting the performing arts was her patronage of the Shiraz Arts Festival. This occasionally controversial event was held annually from 1967 until 1977 and featured live performances by both Iranian and Western artists. The majority of her time, however, went into the creation of museums and the building of their collections. As a former architecture student, the Empress's appreciation of it is demonstrated, in the Royal Palace of Niavaran, designed by Mohsen Farugi, and completed in 1968, it mixes traditional Iranian architecture with 1960s contemporary design. Nearby is the personal library of the Empress, consisting of 22,000 books, comprising principally works on Western and Eastern art, philosophy and religion, the interior was designed by Aziz Farm and Farmayan. Historically a culturally rich country, the Iran of the 1960s had little to show for it. Many of the great artistic treasures produced during its 2,500 year, history had found their way into the hands of foreign museums and private collections. It became one of the Empress's principal goals to procure, for Iran an appropriate collection of its own historic artifacts. To that end, she secured from her husband's government permission and funds to buy back a wide selection of Iranian artifacts from foreign and domestic collections. This was achieved with the help of the brothers Hu Shang and Mehdi Mababian, the most prominent Iranian antiquities dealers of the era, who advised the Empress from 1972 to 1978. 
With these artifacts she founded several national museums, many of which still survive to this day, and began an Iranian version of the National Trust. Museums and cultural centers created under her guidance include the Nagestan Cultural Center, the Reza Abbasi Museum, the Koramabad Museum with its valuable collection of Loriston bronzes, the National Carpet Gallery and the Glassware and Ceramic Museum of Iran. Aside from building a collection of historic Iranian artifacts, the Empress also expressed interest in acquiring contemporary Western and Iranian art. To this end, she put her significant patronage behind the Tehran Museum of Contemporary Art. The fruits of her work in founding and expanding, that institution are perhaps the Empress' most enduring cultural legacy to the people of Iran. She also got some international awards to her name Austria, look. Women of the Year Hope Award France, Foreign Associate Academician of the Académie des Beaux-Arts Germany, Steiger Award Germany, Sudwestfalen Charlie Award United States, National Museum of Women in the Arts Award for International Cultural Patronage. What do you think of our list? Which of the facts about Farah Pahlavi shocked you the most? Let me know in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this video and want to hear from me again, be sure to hit that subscribe button before you go.